Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. The biggest overhaul of our defence force since World War II will see us rapidly acquire long-range strike capabilities. That means our military will be able to hit targets at sea. It's in response to rising military threats from China. But while we're angering Beijing by upping the ante on a military front, in other areas like trade, things are actually improving. Today, Chinese trade expert and lawyer Wei Wanzhou on the complex diplomatic relationship and how it's undergoing a reset. Wei Wanzhou, Australia and China, we're talking again. We've resolved, it seems, a dispute over Chinese tariffs on Australian barley. How significant is that in your view? I think it's a significant step by both governments. Australia and China agreed to suspend the panel proceeding at the WTO. That we believe it is in both countries' interests uh, for these trade impediments to be re- removed. For China... This means a a peaceful uh, resolution uh, of the disputes with Australia without a panel decision that might actually go against China. Mm. So we're removing this proceeding from the WTO and we're using diplomacy instead, which sounds like a rather good idea. So China could also be about to lift other trade sanctions. It's slapped on at the height of these political tensions back in 2020. Let's talk about those in a minute. But let's go back to that time when everything seemed to be unravelling. This is a virus that has taken more than 200,000 lives across the world. Now, it would seem entirely reasonable and sensible that the world would want to have an independent assessment of how this all occurred. Australia's Prime Minister at the time, Scott Morrison, he'd called for an investigation into the origins of COVID-19 and that infuriated Beijing, didn't it? I think Australia's call for an independent investigation into the origin of COVID-19 at the time was one of the triggers of the tensions. But before all of this happened, there were other incidents as well One of the major incidents was Australia's decision to not buy Huawei's 5G products. And also at the time, Australia stood out as one of the first countries uh, to block Australian vendors to buy uh, from Huawei the 5G products on security concerns. The federal government announced the Chinese technology company Huawei would be banned from supplying equipment for Australia's new 5G mobile network. Communications Minister Mitch Fifield... That was taken by China as Australia aligning with the US, uh, moving away from China and and hence moving away from uh, the economic partnership. So it was a seriously difficult time for the diplomatic relationship We saw at that time, of course, that China ended its $20 billion trade in Bali with Australia. What else did it stop at that time? Around the same time and afterwards, China also imposed anti-subsidy duties on Australian wine. Mm -hmm. China also imposed restrictions on the importation of Australian beef, lobsters, and also importation of Australian coal. Australian officials are scrambling to find out why China appears to have placed a ban on Australian coal. Reports that a key Chinese port was refusing Australian coal imports sent the dollar tumbling. There might be other kind of measures taken by China at the time, um, but these are the major ones. And then we fast forward to 2021 when relations took another turn for the worse. We saw tensions escalate around Hong Kong and also comments by the then Defence Minister Peter Dutton about Taiwan. If there was to be a conflict in Taiwan and the United States was to enter into a conflict with China, then in my judgment it would be inconceivable given 
uh, the conditions of the ANZUS alliance that we wouldn't be by America's side. So how did that then affect things? Yeah, I think these events have significantly uh, escalated the tension, as you say, and also uh, caused further deterioration. China have imposed um, during this whole period a series of restrictions on Australian exports. And you can see that China has been very strategic in selecting the goods to target, but also in selecting the measures or the restrictions to use so that can be imposed and removed quickly. If you think about um, how much Australian barley producers, wine uh, producers actually sell to China on a yearly basis in the, before COVID, uh, the impact can be very significant. Clearly, the restriction on trade that China put in place when it hit things like barley, like wine, like Australian beef, that was punishment, clearly punishment for Scott Morrison saying that he wanted an international investigation into COVID. My view is that I, I can't comment on the politics side of it, but I think based on the public opinion, um, China's actions were obviously saying as economic coercion. Mm -hmm. I think we can use that word. So let's come back to the present day because Australia got a new government, a new Prime Minister in Anthony Albanese. It clearly is in Australia's national interests, but also in China's interests to have a stabilisation of the relationship. What did China make of that? What do they make of the Labor government, of Anthony Albanese, of his foreign minister, Penny Wong? I think Australia's strategy under the new government uh, in dealing with China has been very effective. And that strategy has been incrementally rebuilding the relationship, but at the same time, carefully uh, managing the disagreements on issues relating to values and national security. And we also have seen some very, very good tactics in engaging with China on sensitive political issues and disagreements before Australia makes announcements mm -hmm. or take action. Now, China has been very, uh, I think, re responsive. Since the new government, uh, the then Premier Li Keqiang sent a, a message to congratulate Prime Minister Albanese to take office. What's important in the body dispute resolution is that it shows that the both parties find a way to remove these actions taken during the tensions and then to rebuild the habits of collaboration instead of confrontation. So let's just put trade to one side, though, because while things are improving on that front, it is tricky for Australia because it does have a strong alliance with the US and there is increasing concern, of course, because of Taiwan, because of the increased military exercises in the Taiwan Strait that China is undertaking. And now we have this defence plan that seemed to be aimed at deterring China's military build-up. The Australian Defence Force will receive its biggest overhaul in decades. The review recommends scaling back of several projects, including infantry fighting vehicles, but the purchase of more long-range missiles. Penny Wong at the press club last week, she said she wants no country to dominate and no country to be dominated. So putting trade aside, there are some big issues still with this diplomatic relationship. I think so. and I. Um, but I also want to mention that Penny Wong also said that she wants to see status quo. Mm -hmm. So today, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about how we avert war and maintain peace. And more than that, how we shape a region that reflects our national interests and our shared regional interests. I think China also wants to see status quo. From that perspective, from the perspective of the, re of the stability and, um, and peace of the region, I can also say alignment of Australia's interests and China's interests. Mm. If the US takes steps to destabilize the uh, stability in this region, um, I don't think that Australia would, under the current government, 
align with the U.S. interests and, and, and to follow U.S. actions from that perspective. Aren't we really talking about China destabilizing the region with its threats towards Taiwan, not the U.S.? Um, there is always kind of the interaction between U.S. actions and China's actions. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, is in Taiwan tonight, and China is already responding. Across the 100-mile-wide Taiwan Strait, it's a battle of drills. I think it's the U.S., China, the broader kind of geopolitical competitions and tensions between the two countries. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Australia, I think Australia's policy and strategy at the moment works quite well in terms of uh, standing in the middle of U.S. and China. Australia has been doing, I think, the right thing by gradually disentangling economic interests from security interests. But at the same time, uh, maintain disagreements with China on values and national security issues, mm -hmm. but not necessarily uh, immediately taking sides with the US. Obviously, there are other issues, but if we're just looking at trade, China seems impressed from what you've said at the approach that the current government is taking. So tell me, do you think now that the trade of barley is likely to resume or will resume, what comes next? Do you think other barriers are likely to fall? I think um, the Bali dispute resolution provides a very good template and also help. So immediately, I think what we can anticipate um, is that the China's anti-dumping and anti-subsidy duties on wine can be removed uh, through the same approach. Because there was, there, there is currently also a WTO dispute on that. Both barley and wine will go back to Chinese markets because there is a demand. Mm. And also because the quality of Australia's products and also competitiveness in the Chinese market. But also to think about China also has an investment interest in Australia. I mean, if you think about the China Australia free trade agreement, that was one of the major a reciprocal uh, benefits that the two countries gave to each other. Mm, so step by step, we could be back to where we were trade-wise before 2020, before the crisis of, of 2020. I think so. I'm quite optimistic about the future. Associate Professor Wei Wanzhou is a lawyer and international trade expert at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He's previously worked advising the Chinese government and Chinese state-owned companies and as a consultant to the World Trade Organization. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Veronica Apap and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. I'm Sam Hawley. Thanks for listening. <laughs>